2023 has already seen a couple of the biggest box office disasters of all time, including The Flash, Indiana Jones, and the live action Little Mermaid. Nope, no, no, Little Mermaid did not lose money. It absolutely did. Now, see, you're just looking at ticket sales. They made so much money from streaming rights. I'm sorry, Disney paid themselves to stream their own movie and that counts as profit? On paper, yes. Uh-huh. So the biggest losers of the year include live action Little Mermaid, but it's possible they won't have to hold the shameful title of biggest loser for long because in two short weeks, the Marvels is going to be excreted onto a screen near you and the projected numbers are hilariously low. Whoever could have seen this coming? Huh, me, obviously, back in the spring before the first trailers even came out. And in just a minute, we'll break it all down, but we recently got some news that makes the inevitable failure even larger. First, reports have come in that the production budget for this film is $270 million, and that does not include marketing, which looks to be kind of light, likely because even the studio knows this is going to be an epic bomb. Let's guess wildly at the marketing and say eh, it's going to be half of production, maybe $130 million, which is convenient because that adds up to an even $400 million. Since theaters keep about half of ticket sales, this estimate means the movie would need roughly $8 hundred million dollars to break even. Good Lord! That's a lot of money! But Greg, I hear some of you typing, the original Captain Marvel raked in over a billion dollars. Brie Larson is a headliner. She's the new face of the MCU. Quit being a toxic masculine fanboy and accept the reality that these strong female characters are gonna dominate the box office. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Stop typing that, because our next bit of news involves the projected openings for Captain Marvel 2. Initially, the projections were between 50 to 75 million for the opening weekend, but new reports are projecting a much more solid 70 to 80. In her debut weekend, Captain Marvel pulled in $160 million, meaning this sequel could open to half what the original brought in. If that trend continues, it puts the Marvels around 550 million total. I know I sound pessimistic, but without the aid of Endgame coming in six weeks and the news that the Marvels is going to be a wacky comedy, I predict a final tally in the upper 400s. America is getting tired of this crap, and the lucrative Chinese market is notoriously averse to non-white characters like uh, two of the three leads, so I don't see a strong worldwide showing for this. But let's get into the deets, as the kids say. How do you do, fellow kids? Now let's throw it to my favorite guest, past Greg, and we'll see that his reasonings and predictions from six months ago are shockingly accurate. I hope you're sitting down because I'm gonna say something you've never heard on the internet before. I think the Marvels is going to bomb harder than the Enola Gay. That is brand new information! Crazy, I know, but this video is not an opinion piece about why the movie's gonna suck like a collapsing star. No, we are taking a deep dive today into the many factors working against this movie that will almost certainly cause it to fail both critically and commercially. Part two is gonna deal with the drama and the politics behind the scenes, but today we're looking at why people are not going to go to the theaters to see this movie's plot or characters. Let's start with what brings an audience into the theater. Theater, mostly actors and characters. This movie's got three main characters, which should triple its chances of resonating with someone, enticing them to buy a ticket and come in and see where the story goes, but not one of them is going to do it. Two of these leads are characters that most people have only heard about in passing. Disney seems to be banking on people having completed their Disney Plus TV homework to understand who these characters are, or they're gonna have to include heavy exposition to tell us why we should give a damn about them. Homework's a bad move on Disney's part, but essential for game night. Have you ever tried to explain the rules to Catan or Villainous to somebody? Is it Catan or Catan? Point is, don't come to my house unless you've watched a YouTube video and you know the rules first. I wouldn't put the info dump past them. As we talked about in a previous video, many talentless writers are relying on monologues at the beginning of their projects to inform the audience. It gives us the information, but it leaves out why we should care. That exposition is also going to take up valuable screen time that needs to be used for, you know, little things like introducing a villain, conflict, growing character arcs. I think you're overthinking it. I think you're underthinking it. This might be shaping up to rival Age of Ultron in terms of breakneck pacing and speed running character screen time. So when's the last time you heard somebody talking about Monica Rambeau? 
Uh, just a quick refresher, if you need it, I know I did. If you ask someone that question, you usually also have to prompt them with, hey, remember the black gal from WandaVision? Remember right at the end, she got the blue colored plot powers, which were different from Wanda's red colored plot powers? C you know, cause they're blue. Oh, right, that character relies on you having Disney Plus and watching the show all the way through and paying attention to a side character. I did the math, she had 32 minutes of screen time across nine episodes, which is honestly more than it felt like. Now, Rambeau's got the beginning innings of a good character, she's got the foundation of good motive and hopes and fears to one day frame a story upon, but we don't have it yet. So the audience is not going to show up to the movie for a character they don't even know yet. I've used this one before, but whatever. Hey, Athena, who's going to go see the Marvels just to see Monica Rambeau? Nobody, baby. She gets it. Next up, we've got Captain Marvel, who is generally disliked, as is the actress who plays her, Brie Larson, and even she knows it. You play Captain Marvel for? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone want me to do it again? <laughs> don't be so modest. I don't know. I really don't know. People who try to defend her movie point to its amazing box office receipts, which were over a billion dollars, which is extremely impressive for any film. One caveat to point out, however, is that she was tossed in right before Endgame at the absolute height of the Infinity Saga hype cycle, and we were all led to believe that she was going to be key to defeating Thanos. Basically, everybody was invested in seeing that saga to the end, and so they packed the theaters to see this final origin story right before the big boss fight. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. The money rolled in, but so did the negative reviews. She and her character were extremely bland and predictable. Marvel also dropped any pretense of neutrality in the social justice arena, having heavy girl boss messaging that shockingly didn't resonate with a lot of the male audience and much of the female. That fight scene being set to no doubts just a girl, very subtle. They're already pandering. They can't pander any harder. They tried it again the next month with that scene in Endgame that had even female audiences rolling their eyes. I have no doubt they will do it again in a hero movie with three female mains. Captain Marvel is the most known but least liked of all of these characters. She's definitely not going to draw an audience in. If anything, she might be a repellent. Ms. Marvel is the only character that could draw a crowd, but nobody seems to care about her for some reason. The teenager figuring out their powers thing is a really easy character to get behind, just like Peter Parker. I didn't watch it, but the relatively few people that did said she was a very likable character with a very good arc. Trouble is, nobody saw it. Maybe it was just bad timing. Maybe people were having Marvel show fatigue. Whatever it was, her initial view numbers were half of the next highest show. I did an extremely scientific poll of my family and everybody enjoyed the show, but they're not dying to see more of this character. General consensus was the show could have stood on its own, could have been a one and done thing. Would they watch a second season? Sure, but they wouldn't be glued to the TV on premiere day. It's like one of those, I'll get around to it kind of things, you know? She definitely is not a draw to the Marvels simply because she's not on anyone's radar. Only a small fraction of the audience is gonna show up just to see where the overall MCU is going. Currently, the MCU is plot driven, not character driven. They're trying to sell the multiverse and the Kang war and this big picture idea sort of. It's still not super clear. Thing is, they've lost the characters in pursuit of that grand design. So the characters don't matter, just the phase plot. The characters are becoming interchangeable and their motives aren't even their own. Now I'm the bad guy. Their actions are only in service to that plot and, you know, whatever message the director or the producer want to send. You've got to do better, Senator. But we go to the movie to see people, not plots, and as the characters are becoming sandwich boards, the audience is just finding something else to do with their time. So you got three main characters that nobody really knows or cares about, but Marvel expects us to care, and it's going to feel so forced. Kevin Feige was quoted as saying, seeing all three of these characters on screen at the same time is chilling and is on par with the first time we saw all the Avengers together on screen. Oh, are we playing a game where everyone says something stupid? Come on, Kev, you can't be serious. That moment was the culmination of literal years of work. You had multiple full length movies, a clearly laid out plan that had the audience excited for that exact moment to finally happen. I'm very certain that moment can never be replicated by anyone. It was literally a game changer. I know it's his job to hype his own brand, but 
Seriously? Come on, man. No one cares enough about these characters or this team to give a damn about them being together on screen. These women have never even been in the same room, but now we're supposed to root for them to team up? Why, just because it's a diverse female team? His attitude tells me they just don't get it, and we, the audience, are expected to just lap it up. But that brings up another point that the Avengers actually had a direction. Even early on, we had a clear vision of these Infinity Stones. The main villain of Avengers had already been introduced in Thor. Each character already had a very solid arc that was then furthered in that movie. Oh my god, it finally happened. I have never spilled my drink while gesturing. Son of a bitch. In the cup today is Tazo Purple Passion Tea, because I've already had enough caffeine. Back then, everything made sense and everything fit together. Now, fast forward a decade and the Marvel of today is completely rudderless. We might be forming a team in this movie, but why does it even matter? There are plenty of teams at this point. The MCU has expanded to encompass the universe. Some of these characters have godlike powers. You've got the Eternals floating around somewhere. I apologize, I forgot you were there. Kang might be the villain here, I, I don't know, but he died to Ant-Man, so if it is Kang, it'll be a different Kang. Time travel and multiverses exist, so the stakes of everything, basically zero. It's all just a meandering mess. They tried a lot of things in phase four and most of it failed, but now they've got these threads all over the place and they're trying to bullshit us with this idea that they're making one cohesive cloth. If Disney Plus were a much larger platform and they had a real plan, the idea of these little supplemental projects in addition to the major cinematic universe is honestly a really cool idea. They could use TV to tell these smaller stories like Moon Knight, which seems to be largely inconsequential to the overall phase story, and they could save that big story and those popular characters for the theater. The issue with what they're doing now, besides just not having a general plan, is that they're putting things in the shows that are key to understanding the movies. Now it's not a fun supplement, it's homework. Disney is giving you assigned reading so you understand the lecture in the theater. Guys, what do we think about extra work? Work sucks. I know! Now there is certainly a segment of the audience who would go for this. They will consume every piece of Marvel content to understand the overall narrative and how it all fits together, even though it really doesn't. But that group is far too small to justify $300 million movies, which is likely what the Marvels is going to cost, if not more. We don't know the price tag yet, but the trend has been $250 million for the last several movies. I would expect the Marvels to be even higher, possibly that 300 or more, because it has so much extra expense, like two rounds of reshoots now. Those reshoots are also gonna involve extra CGI. The CGI budget is going to be enormous because all of the characters' powers were lie on CGI. We also have reports that the Marvels is doing very poorly in front of test audiences, and so they're tweaking plot points and changing the ending. The point here is that the bills are racking up. All of this fixing is not cheap, and when the final tally is over 300 million, I will not be surprised. We've all heard this rule of thumb that a movie needs like twice production costs to break even, so the Marvels might need over 600 million dollars just to keep from losing money. It's very telling that they keep pushing this movie back when they were hyping it before. Some people are theorizing they want to push the loss into the next fiscal year. What was supposed to be a fresh start with a strong direction for the franchise is now likely just going to join the muddy mess. Thanks pass Greg. I was so close on that budget prediction and I think future reports are going to prove me 100% correct. But let's keep going and talk about the politics in part two. Can you believe that they shamelessly put cats in that trailer just to get people to watch it and like the video? I don't consider myself a Nostradamus for predicting that a movie on its second round of reshoots and its fifth release date is going to be a commercial failure. You didn't see that coming? In part one we talked about how the film features a cast of characters that won't be drawing in a crowd and the MCU trajectory as a whole isn't interesting to the audience either. Today we're looking at the actors, director, and writers to see how they will almost certainly be injecting politics into this movie and that will further drive the audience away. Okay, I'm not supposed to give the video away up front, but I want to make it clear why any of this matters. The amount of pandering and virtue signaling is bound to be sky high, as we'll see. Why are you giving candy to a baby in the first place? Don't give candy to a baby. And that's important because it's probably going to get in the way of the story and it's bound to scare away an audience that just wants to see a superhero movie, not a sermon. Even people that agree with left-leaning politics 
don't want to see them in a Marvel movie. To be clear, the movie would still suck if it was on the other side and the villain was like a drag queen who was nefariously trying to trap children in a show, but DeSantis Man came to stop him. Now, when people that look like me, you're so white, criticize these politics being in Marvel movies, we often hear the sad excuse of, you ever think you're not the target audience? I am well aware, and that is exactly my point. The target audience is tiny and is not going to justify the production budget, which in the last video we talked about might be as high as $300 million. When this movie doesn't turn a profit, it's because they match the wrong product to the wrong audience. Don't park your pulled pork food truck outside of a mosque and then complain about phobes and isms when you don't make any money. Congratulations, you played yourself. That said, let's talk about the politics of the people involved, and then we'll talk about that new trailer. First up, we've got writer and director Nia DaCosta, who is very inexperienced. She has two feature film credits, Little Woods and the most recent Candyman, both of which receive middling reviews. Besides those, she's got a handful of producing and directing credits for short films that were shown at festivals. There are two big problems this presents. The first is that she has been put in charge of a massive project that is supposed to rival the Avengers. The MCU is not dead, but it's showing very worrying symptoms and they need a big win to restore confidence. You don't hand that kind of responsibility to someone with this kind of experience. She hasn't managed any large action sequences, any large amounts of CGI. Chances are her inexperience is going to show in the final product unless this movie is going to be made by committee. Admittedly, I'm a very cynical person, but to me, DaCosta feels like a PR hire. She is now officially the youngest person to direct a Marvel feature film and a black woman. So young black female gets highest role in movie making. I don't feel like it's that much of a stretch to suggest that Marvel brought her on so they could virtue signal. That leads to the earlier speculation that this movie is going to be run by committee with other Marvel folks doing the lifting for the action and CGI sequences. If that's the case, it's going to feel like a movie made by committee and that's going to lead to poor reviews which is going to lead to lower turnout wake, wake me when the show starts it's already been on a while <laughs> wake me when it's over or i'm wrong and she's in full control which is very worrying for the political tone of the movie DaCosta makes projects that deal with liberal ideas about race socioeconomics and gender her debut film little woods hits all the talking points. Two women are forced into crime because poverty and gender and capitalism and oil industry. The main character has to run pharmaceuticals across the Canadian border because American healthcare. Her sister has to be smuggled into Canada just to have an abortion because sexism and American politics. It's the kind of movie that highbrow critics love to praise and audiences could not care less about. Reading the description reminds me of 2006's Babel, where everything is just horrible and you don't know why but it's supposed to be deep one critic compliment sums it up nicely it's a stunning deep and thoughtful portrait of two marginalized women in america forgotten by city folk and the political class wow yeah that's heavy ogre then her second movie is Candyman, which is a horror flick that also deals with issues of race, gentrification, and police brutality. Cool. Quick aside, the movie Candyman takes place on the site of the old Cabrini Green housing projects. There's another one in nearby St. Louis. It was called Pruitt Igo. If you've never dug into the history and downfall of these projects, it is absolutely fascinating. I highly recommend looking into it. Huh, <sighs> feeling basic today. Just regular old Folgers and half and half. It's in my cup where I keep my caffeine. Got this cup from a website that no longer exists where I also bought a t-shirt that contains the numerical answer for life, the universe, and everything. No! So why are DaCosta's politics relevant? Marvel is losing momentum and they need a big win right now. And that means broad appeal and heavy messaging ain't gonna do it. There's a reason Tyler Perry makes Tyler Perry movies and Michael Bay makes Michael Bay movies. They're different directors for different audiences and they have different budgets. Neither is better. Perry makes a profit on every movie he makes. So if Spike Lee gets hired to handle the next billion dollar Avatar film, it's going to be a damn mess because you're mixing up genres and messages and audiences. 
Given DaCosta's background, that is exactly what's happening here. And I do feel confident that she's going to inject politics into this movie. She is a young director being handed a massive franchise. She's absolutely going to take the chance to over ambitiously push her personal message on the biggest stage she's ever had. You might be thinking, Greg, those are important issues. We got to talk about those issues. And you are 100% correct. But if you put them in a Marvel superhero movie, the audience ain't going to show up and it's going to lose money and don't act surprised. I know it sounds base, but it, Lisa, can you tell what does a movie need more than anything? She understands the goal. My goal is to entertain you first, but also to get you to improve yourself. And I always recommend Audible to do that. Get you a lecture, learn you something, invest in yourself. You want a free month of Audible? There's an affiliate link in the description. Tayana Paris, who plays Monica Rambeau, is also a producer and star of race films. They include Dear White People, Chi Rock, Chi Rock, If Beale Street Could Talk, and the aforementioned Candyman. All films dealing with the black experience, black stories. That's cool, and I want to re-stress the subject matter is not wrong. The issue is black-centric movies don't cost what Marvel movies cost, and they don't gross what Marvel movies gross. If she pushes to bring in race politics, it's going to drive ticket sales down. Lastly, there's Brie Larson, and it's pretty well known that she and the audience aren't getting along. Many people think she said she doesn't want white men seeing her movies, but that's actually not true. That situation actually was she was talking about the movie A Wrinkle in Time, and she said, I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. It wasn't made for him. I want to know what that film meant to women of color, to biracial women, to teen women of color. That movie was widely panned and lost $120 million. This is my exact concern for the Marvels. If it's not made for white men, and that's perfectly fine, but then when they don't show up and the movie doesn't make the seven to $800 million that it might need just to break even, Please don't act surprised. I don't want to devote too much time to this, but apparently Paris and Larson are feuding on set, according to rumor. Larson supposedly wanted the movie to be called Captain Marvel 2. It's all rumor, and it might be overhyped by people that just want to see a cat fight. But if it is true, it's going to reflect in the movie when we see poor chemistry between those actresses. Lastly, DaCosta did not write the screenplay by herself. Megan McDonnell has two credits. One for WandaVision and one for a short video called Meet Cute. Zeb Wells is credited with writing one episode of She-Hulk, doing a lot of work for Robot Chicken in addition to his main career of being a comic writer for Marvel Comics. McDonald's lack of experience is just as much of an issue as DaCosta's, and Wells' work on Robot Chicken is worrisome because that's a very specific type of humor. From what we saw of the trailer, the humor looks to be Thor Love and Thunder level, which didn't work out well. And let's talk about that trailer. We didn't get much plot in this movie, we just got a really kick-ass Beastie Boys track over what are probably supposed to be the funny parts of the movie. The trailer was pretty fun. It looks lighthearted and honestly very cute in spots, but the movie's still not going to turn a profit. Can you believe that they shamelessly put put cats in that trailer just to get people to watch it and like the video. They used to advise writers to save the cat. Now, in Marvel Cinematic Universe, Cat saves you! Obviously, we've only got two minutes to go on, but it looks like the body swapping humor is going to be heavily relied upon, as is Kamala's fangirling. <laughs> Both are going to be fun, to a point. Knowing Marvel, they're going to be overdone in the first hour. Wells' robot chicken humor is evident here, and since this movie started production years ago, it's going to contain the same comedic tone as all the most recent films. They've done some reshoots, but they haven't had enough time as a company to fix what are obviously major problems with the brand. Just based on this trailer, I think it's going to feel very much like Thor 4. Quips on quips on quips. Look at my quip, 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 quip. With the people involved and Marvel's history so far, this movie seems like it's going to be a big preachy mess with low hanging fruit comedy that a lot of men are not going to want to go see. And as we talked about in the Why the Female MCU is Failing video, a lot of women aren't going to want to see it either. Marvel is losing the audience. Like it or not, sex sells. And men showed up to the theater to see their favorite childhood heroes and Black Widow. And sex sold the women too. Can you look at me with a straight face and tell me that Chris Hemsworth's acting is what sold Thor or Chris Evans as Captain America. Agent Carter is every woman in this scene like, oh, I want to touch you. Oh my God. I oh, just want to touch it. Obviously, sex is not going to hold the audience's attention long term like a good character will. 
but it does get him in the door. These new characters, save for possibly one day Ms. Marvel, are not inspiring or empowering the audience like Steve Rogers or Tony Stark did. Marvel was successful when they had characters on screen that one gender or the other wanted to be or bang. Let me know your thoughts on the Marvels and that new trailer and the trajectory of the MCU as a whole. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next time.